again in the shotgun. Gets the snap. Everybody into the pattern. Green steps up, throws back in the end zone. This time the Broncos have the touchdown. Billy Bowens with the score. Well, for the second straight week, the Boise State football team picks up a blowout victory on the blue. Clydesdale team is out there. A lot of defensive linemen. Direct snap to Jetty, And Jetty's going to walk in for a touchdown. There was a huge hole on the left side of the line. Jetty into the end zone. Jetty is over 100 yards for the first time. This time, George Halani and Ashton Jenty combined for over 250 yards rushing as the Broncos rush for 316 as a team. Fife looking downfield, throws it, and it's intercepted by Rodney Robinson. It was intended for Cropper. And on defense, the Broncos were outstanding once again, including Rodney Robinson getting his first career interception. Robinson jumped in front of him, got the pass, it's intercepted, and the Broncos have the turnover. Welcome once again into Jay Sports Bar. I'm Jay Tuss, he's Shane Williams-Rhodes. Uh, we're not doing this, the show in the same, same state today. Shane, kind enough to join us from his home state of Texas. Shane, how we doing on the bye week? Man, I'm doing good, doing good. You know, I came out here, you know, I'm going to make sure I say what's up to Taylor and his parents, you know, pay a little homage while I'm here. <laughs> I get you. I get you. Well, man, uh, once again, we're in a good mood talking about Boise State football. The Broncos pick up a 40-20 to 20 victory over the Bulldogs. The milk can is staying in Boise. And for the second straight game, not only a, a blowout victory, but a really solid performance in the second half. A week ago, Boise State finished the San Diego State game on a 35-0 run. Uh, against Fresno State, they finished the game on a 20 to nothing run. How encouraging is it to see these adjustments that are going on in-game and obviously uh, resulting on the scoreboard? I think it's a combination. I think it's it's the in-game adjustments along with we're running the ball, right? So if you're running the ball a lot, you're going to start wearing down your opponent. And we can definitely see, as you saw for now, two games back-to-back, -back, the more we run the ball, the better we get, the better we get as the game goes on. So I think that we just got to keep pounding the rock. That's our identity. It's great to know that when we fall back on what we do good at, we just we start we start separating. So we're in a good spot right now. I want to talk about this defense, how Boise State's going to utilize the bye, and, and maybe we'll even get a little bit of a glimpse at Air Force. We'll go into that more next week on Jay Sports Bar. But um, when it comes to this ground game, and, and you focus on George Halani and Ashton Genty, before we get to those guys, I want to talk to you about the impact that Taylor Green is clearly having on this ground game. Because you look at his numbers, he threw two touchdowns, uh, his first career touchdown through the air to Billy Bowens. But only rush for 22 yards in this game. But in your mind, like what impact is he having on the ground game despite, you know, that, that modest rushing total for him personally? So it's not really so much of him being effective, it's of him being a threat. And that's what we saw this week. So I felt like in that second half, uh, Fresno came out and was like, we are not gonna allow this quarterback, you know, to pull this ball and just take off on us. And, you know, they saw it happen the week before and so, I feel like they were so focused on him and allowed, you know, our, our running backs, like we've been saying for the last few weeks, we have the two best running backs in the conference when it comes to committee. So, I mean, you consider it three running backs when you include our quarterback. So they, they tried to stick with it and we just started pounding it. And I feel like once Gentry and Alani kind of get, kind of get going, it's really hard to stop them because these guys are fresh. These guys aren't rotating every two plays. Like we're seeing them come in and get a drive. Like, we, I saw Halani go in for a drive, and then I saw him come out, and I saw the next drive hit you as Genty. Like, these guys are fresh, so they're ready to go full speed when they do get in. So, it, it's huge right now in the run game. Yeah, that was one thing that kind of stood out to me. Uh, George, by the way, said, as he was trying to encourage a young Taylor Green about, you know, again, kind of some modest numbers statistically, he said, man, Taylor, they're afraid of you. We're having success because they're afraid of you. And so that stuff between the tackles was there all night for Boise State, whether it be uh, Genty or Halani for that matter. You mentioned that these guys are staying fresh. I think the moment that kind of really stood out for me about the trust, the confidence that this coaching staff has in Ashton Genty, Boise State's up 10 with six, seven minutes to go. 
And I thought Helani was going to come onto the field and finish this thing off, but it was actually the true freshman in Ashton Genty. So what does that say about the, the coach's confidence that they have in, in the young kid? And how will that obviously play into keeping George Helani fresh to the point that he can carry the ball 17 times in a game and average over nine yards per carry? You know, this kind of takes me back to when we – back in 2014. You have, uh, let's say, top five back in the nation at, at Boise State, uh, Jay Ajayi. And Jay was getting 27 to 33 carries a game. Uh, being Jay's roommate, uh, just specifically at the festival, uh, it was after uh, New Year's. It was actually New Year's Eve, our game was. And after the game, everyone went out, you know, enjoyed themselves. We won. Uh, you know, it's New Year's, right? Jay never left our hotel room because he was in so much pain from all the hits he took during the Fiesta Bowl. Running someone 27 to 35 times a game, it's going to take a toll no matter what. They don't have to get hit hard, but it's just the constant impact. So when you have a running back who can match your starter and you can split those carries in half and both guys still have over 15 carries, I mean, that is really, really dangerous. I mean, and that's really tough. I mean, I think the only team you see in the NFL that even does it well is the Cleveland Browns. You don't miss a beat when you put it in your backup. So now that takes a little bit less hits off of Nick Chubb, which means he'll be able to play a little bit longer. Kareem Hunt's able to come on the field. He's fresh. When Nick Chubb takes that drive off, he comes back and makes drive. Now he's fresh. He's gone. And so this is just really a blessing in disguise to have both these guys. And then, like, like you just said, being able to have that quarterback that always poses a threat. Whether he's not going to pull it or he is, you have to respect it. And when you do that, you give us numbers, and now we got we got two good backs that are fresh running down your throat. Shane, Shane when it comes to uh, Ashton, you played as a true freshman at Boise State. Is it cliche to say, oh, yeah, you know, as you get a little experience, you're going to play better? Or, or how does that actually apply to his success as he gets deeper and deeper into the season? So this is his first time probably in his life that the players on the field are just as fast as him. I know for me, it was much like that. Uh, I felt like my entire career, I was always quicker than everyone. But what I did realize is I was not faster than everyone. So there was no, I'm going to break for 80 yards and just be gone. <laughs> you always got to worry about the backside corner, backside safety. But I think for him, okay, he sees it. He's not necessarily breaking for 60 and 70 yards as often as he was in high school. I don't know if anybody's watched his highlight tapes from high school, but he was ridiculous there, just as you can see he is in college. But I think as things start going, as he gets to his sophomore year, things will be slower because he'll know, okay, when I get through the line, the safety won't be here. He'll be at this point. So now I know I need to take this angle in order to outrun him. It's just repetition. It's with anything. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And so him knowing where guys will be at from repetition of going through those plays and seeing those looks, he'll be so much better next year. It's, it's just so scary. How do you develop the skill? And maybe it comes from instinct. The one thing I remember about you, you know, you, you were a smaller player, especially on, on, you know, any given Saturday, right? But you never really took too many big hits. And for Ashton, I don't feel like he's taken that many big hits. He has this ability to really reduce like where, where a defender is going to impact him, it seems like. What, what, why is he so good at that? You know, like you said, it's instincts. But as a guy who wants to obviously make people miss, which I feel Gentry is definitely uh, one, of those, one of those guys, you just don't want anybody to ever hit you full man. What I mean by that is you want them to attack you half man. So if someone tackles me, I want to be able to not allow their head or anything – to get to my chest, you know, to my shoulder. I want them to be tackling me with their arms. So if I can just do some type of subtle move to where now I got you to where you have to reach your arm out to tackle me rather than be able to run, drive your whole body through me, I'm going to win because now it comes down to do I have better balance than you? Am I able to, you know, avoid a little bit more this way and then put my foot in the ground and go? And I think he has that. Obviously, you see, he's not only just making guys miss and running through arm tackles. He's running through some of these regular tackles, too. Yeah. Uh, he's got a really, really good base. I'm going to go back, and I'm going to watch Ashton Jetty highlights with a little new perspective now. But, I, man, it definitely seems like that's the reason why he's, he's been able to break so many tackles uh, for a kid that is, that is so young. Hey, 
when it comes to George Halani, I've said this a couple of times. I feel like he is going to contend for Mountain West Conference Offensive Player of the Year. I said it before the season. I said it last week. He rushes for a buck 57 last week. He averages nine yards per carry, which uh, is just a crazy clip if you're, if you're getting 17 carries in a game as a running back. Um, what do you think it is about his game that has finally clicked behind this offensive line, Shane? Because it certainly seems like they're, they're developing something there that's pretty special. You know, I hate to say it this way, but the best thing that happened to George Halani this year is Ashton Gentry. Once again, it's being able to come on the field healthy. Uh, we haven't seen a healthy George Halani since freshman year. Mm -hmm. Being able to see him come on and just be healthy, not having to go out and play with a sprained ankle or just a hurt knee or, you know, he's fresh. He's fresh because he's not taking so many hits. And he knows that if he, I feel this is how it is. If you know that you can come off the field, and you don't have to worry about the team still getting converting on third down because the guy behind you is just as good. Feel a little bit better about coming off and grabbing some water and then going back in maybe in two plays versus if you know that it's kind of the way they're all on your shoulders, which is kind of how it's been. I mean, in the past, we've had some bigger backs behind them, but not guys who are as explosive as he is behind them. So it just changes everything. And so now with all that confidence that I feel like he has in his backup and that the coaching staff has, He's able to get fresh and get healthy and all those things. You know, I feel like if there was ever a week where he was hurt and they didn't let us know, we would never actually find out because what they would do is just rotate those guys enough to not have him take so many hits, which is what they're doing now. It's just, I'm telling you, it's having that depth. It's just, it's a different ball game. <laughs> Well, I, I will say this, too. We talked with head coach Andy Avalos after the game last week, and George Halani chimed in as well. And, and we asked them why they've had success in the ground game recently. And uh, basically it was the fact that hard work and patience has led to a whole lot of production. The O-line has a much better block, uh, box to block when you know some of those numbers are getting pulled out onto the perimeter for the quarterback's number. Um, but I will say this, too. Um, George and Ashton have done a phenomenal job um, in the run game in terms of, you know, we got a few different schemes we run, but they've, you know, in the zone schemes, they, they've had tremendous vision. They've set up those blocks for the O linemen to help the O linemen. I mean, it just doesn't happen. I mean, they're literally trained on these uh, mid zone schemes, how to stay on a track to help the O linemen um, get to their blocks and their combinations. and. I mean, they spent a lot, a lot of time, and it's just awesome to see how it's coming together now. When us as the offense gets in rhythm, uh, we can really look smooth out there in the run game. And being able to communicate uh, up front with the O-line, making sure they ID the right guys, I think uh, that continues to build the rhythm for our offense that we're trying to find. And... Uh, it's been working for us, so we're going to keep going. Shane, as we look forward now, I mean, Boise State has the bye this week, a great time for them to rest up, considering it is exactly halfway through the season. When they return to action, they get Air Force, and then it always seems like as you get a little deeper into the season, teams maybe re rely a little bit more on their ground game as you know, weather and certain elements start to play a factor. That's almost undoubtedly going to be the case with November trips to both Reno and Wyoming still to come for, for the Boise State football team. So how much confidence is what they're doing right now on the ground, not only breathing life into the offense, but the defense, the special teams, the coaching staff, all of it? How much more confident are, is this ground game allowing this Boise State football team to play with right now? Oh, man, we talked about it, I think, two weeks ago. Uh, I think I referenced the Ravens, you know, back when they had Ray Lewis and Ray Rice and all those guys. That team was great because they had a great defense and they had a great run game. They knew that they were going to go out. Ray Rice was going to have 120 rushing yards, and that defense was going to keep it was going to keep the other team out of the end zone. That is exactly the vibes I get from this team. They have a great defense and a wonderful run, run game. That is the key to success. If you ask anyone what you have to do on offense in order to be successful, everyone's going to say you have to be able to establish a run. If you ask anyone what you have to do to be successful on defense, is obviously you have to be able to stop the run. We can do both. On top of that, our defense also isn't too bad on the back end. So I think we have everything that's the recipe for success. Obviously, in the past, that has not been our, our identity. I mean, we've had some great backs, but we've also been able just to swing the ball around quite a bit in the past. So it's, it's a different look for the team. I think going into a bye week, uh, this is kind of great to be going in, obviously, with the way we've been playing. Uh, this is the perfect week to have a bye week defensively because now you got to prep for Air Force. You know, this is going to be a lot different. 
Uh, with how great our defense is, it really, honestly, you come in the game, it doesn't matter because everything's just different than what you've been doing. You'll have to prep differently. Uh, your assignments will be different this week. You got to be disciplined this week. This is where we'll actually find out how disciplined we've been playing or if we're just that much better than everyone mm -hmm. because Air Force is going to be a tough one moving forward, especially on defense. Uh, offensively, their defense is always stout. So, yeah, same thing, but we have to be able to rely on that run game. We just got to wear them down until we start popping them in. Everyone has literally gotten the example of how you establish the run game as you, you keep running the ball until you start popping it, and we've done it the last two games, and hopefully that's just how we can carry out. This also is a good week for Taylor to kind of, and the coaching staff, to kind of focus in on the pass game, figure out what he's good at, what he likes, because now we obviously need to improve on our pass game. So yep. this is a good opportunity to do that, knowing that you have a very great running game to rely on. So you have your bread and butter, you have your, your nucleus of plays, but now let's figure out what we're good at in the passing game. Because we obviously know we can't just do anything. Uh, we know we can't, we can't just throw the ball like we used to. Right. It's a matter of playing to Taylor's strengths, getting him out of the pocket. We've talked about that a lot. It'll be interesting to see how that grows. I want to bring up a couple of quick stats for you as it pertains to the ground game. Boise State is one of just eight teams with multiple 300-yard rushing games this season. Amongst that group, only Boise State and Oregon have done it in back-to-back -back games against a conference opponent. As it pertains to George Halani, I brought up his rushing average. He's the 11th Bronco to average nine yards per carry on at least 15 rushes. Uh, in a game since 2000. Halani and Jeremy McNichols are the only BSU players to do it twice over that span. So it shows you George Halani's explosiveness. And right now, he has 18 carries of 10 or more yards. That's second in the Mountain West when it comes to plays of 10 or more yards by an offensive player. So we are seeing that explosion happen. As it goes over to the defensive side of the ball, Shane, this team, not only are they, they tough to drive against, but I think they're tough to, to drive against as an opposing offense because they have really figured out how to limit explosive plays. Um, when it, we, we talk about plays of 10 yards or more with, with George Halani, Boise State has only allowed 36 plays of 10 yards or more on defense. That is by far the best in the country amongst any group out there that has played the same amount of games of Boise State, which is six. Boise State's allowed 36. The next closest team that has played uh, the same amount of games, the same amount, six games, is Ohio State. They've allowed 48 uh, uh, plays of 10 or more yards. So if you're an opposing offense right now going against this, this Boise State defense, I mean, what, what is your attitude going into this thing, knowing it, it is going to be a really long day that you're going to have to be persistent and stay ahead of the chains every single play in order to even have a chance of scoring, it seems like? If you're Air Force, you go into it thinking, this is perfect for us, obviously. We got to get, get five, figure out who's undisciplined on this defense through watching film and, and just keep attacking and running their stuff, just like how we do on offense. If you're any other team in the country that doesn't run the trip option, you got a rough road ahead of you. It's going to be tough for, for a lot of teams. In, in, That's why I think this next matchup for us will be huge. We're going to find out a lot about our team. I, I agree sure. with you because this is almost like a UTEP scenario, and I, I'm, that's going to agitate people. Um, they do it way different at UTEP, but still, the thing that the Miners were successful with that night is it was like these three, four, three-yard carries. They just they just found a way to kind of stay in favorable favorable positions and just barely move the chains. And ultimately, it kept Boise State's offense on the sideline, neutralized them, and and the Miners were able to pull away with a 27-10 victory. So that's going to be huge when it comes to Air Force, who basically does a very similar thing with the triple option. They just kind of almost bleed you to death. Uh, Ezekiel Noah had an outstanding stat line in this last game, Shane. He, you know, he had uh, six tackles. He forced a fumble. He had a pick. He had a sack. Two tackles for loss. After the game, we asked him not only about what he's doing to achieve success, but how this whole Boise State defense is finding a, a rhythm and a stride that is really uh, could be defined as dominant right now. And, and he said it all comes down to mentality. The mentality that we have. Um, and we always talk about on the defensive side, you know, helping the offense as much as we can, you know, and uh, encouragement, the brotherhood, you know, just uh, having each other's back. We always talk about the brotherhood, man, just doing it for the brother to our right and to our left, doing our 111th, um, and then everything will fall into place. Shane, I got another stat for you um, when it comes to Ezekiel Noah. This is the list of Boise State players 
since 2000 that have had an interception, a sack, a forced fumble, and five or more tackles in a game. Again, in the last 22 years, since 2000, Ezekiel Noah, just this last weekend, Dante Dion, Jamar Taylor, and Colt Brooks. Shane, any conversation when it comes to turnovers, if you're, you're associated with Dante Dion, that's a good conversation to be a part of, it would seem. Most definitely. What is he, number three all-time at Mountain West in, in, in turnovers or inceptions? Yep. And then you got Jamar Taylor, second-round pick. I think uh, that's some good company. Uh, with Noah, it's great that this happened because I feel like about four weeks ago, we just talked about him and his growth that we've seen throughout the years because I think I made a comment uh, on one of our shows about three weeks ago, and I said two years ago it was a tackle for a loss play that he did. I said two years ago he would not have made that play. I could see him easily missing that tackle. And I was talking about how the game has slowed down for him over the years, and then you come out this week and boom, you get this. And the best part about this defense, which I don't know if people understand this, is every week on this show we are not talking about the same defender. We are. It is a different person every week, whether it's a safety, whether it's another linebacker, whether it's a defensive lineman. We are talking about a different guy who technically is our player of the game every week. And so that just tells you how good the defense is. It's not one guy. Uh, just let's put it like this. When we played Arizona in the Fiesta Bowl, Scooby Wright was the guy that was going to make every tackle. We got past Scooby, we scored a touchdown, right? With our defense, it's not like that. If you, if you get past that D line, now you got to get past that the group of linebackers. And then you don't want to get past those guys because then you got to run into JL Skinner and Tyreek Jones on the back end. So it's like we have so many guys and they all have different roles, but everyone does their job, which is the best part about watching these guys play. Dude, you're, you're exactly right. And you're taking me to my next point with this. Um, <laughs> it was funny. I talked to JL Skinner a couple weeks ago and I was asking him about DJ Schramm. And, you know, he was joking. He's like, yeah, man, like those guys are taking all my tackles right now. It, it's never – it isn't one guy and everybody's doing their job and they're playing with as this, this cohesive 11 right now uh, that really you could probably even say is, is 22 deep because they send in backups. And, and there is literally no difference right now, it seems, like when they rotate guys on uh, for the starters. That being said, uh, when, we, when I asked, you know, a Andy about the play of his linebackers after the game – he laughed and he said, hey, I played linebacker at Boise State once. And then he Im immediately shifted his, his focus to the guys that play in front of the linebackers, that defensive line. He was like, shoot, man, I would love to play behind this defensive line that, that Zeke and, and DJ are roaming behind because they are doing their jobs and they're allowing those linebackers to be so productive. So, Shane, my question to you is, is what is exactly does that mean? How does a defensive line allow for this like all-conference type production out of, out of two linebackers at Boise State that had a lot of question marks hovering over them and their ability to make plays going into this season? When you have guys like Matlock up front taking on double teams uh, and you have guys, you, you have so many guys doing their job, but because they do their job so well, they take another guy away from where the linebacker should be getting taken care of. So I feel like when they are bringing those blitzes for these backers and when everything's said and done, we're only sent, we're sending less than what they need to block, but we're still getting home and we're, we're causing them to do double teams, which means they can't work up to the next level. When you're, when you're offensive line and you can't work up to the next level, that means the running back, you're basically saying you got to be, beat that guy. And our back, I mean, our, our linebackers are really good. They, they've obviously seen that. And so we have D linemen taking on double teams. Uh, and it makes you have to change your scheme on offense. Because if you go into a game thinking that you're going to run the way you've always been running, but you have a really good defense line, you got to change some stuff. You can't just go one on one with Scott Matlock. He's going to beat it, and now you're going to have a problem in the back, backfield every time. So now you got to change up your schemes. So those guys not being able to work up to the next level is huge. And then when they do work up to the next level, like J.L. Skinner said, uh, they've been taking all his tackles. So if you are able to work up to those linebackers, the safeties don't hit much lighter. So it's, it's <laughs> not, the, not like you're uh, getting a prize or anything. Yeah. I, I think, you know, uh, something that we've kind of hammered on this, this show, too, uh, that I haven't heard talked about a ton elsewhere, but I, I think it's been a, a massive uh, reason why this defense has been so good. 
they have been unreal at tackling. You just, it is very rare that you see a missed tackles. And a broken play that results in success is like a bad snap that we saw against um, you know, Fresno State where the ball rolls 20 yards behind the QB and he just throws it up. And it, that chaos results in one of their biggest plays of the game. But the, the controlled chaos is, I mean, that the Boise State has been able to play with this year has been remarkable because they just don't miss tackles. They give away nothing that's easy. And as we mentioned earlier on the show today, they are really, really good at limiting explosive plays. Shane, as, as we move uh, forward here, when you were in college, I mean, you, you kind of touched on the fact that this is the perfect time to have a bye week because now you get to kind of you prep your game plan and detail for facing a very specific offense like Air Force. But, like, how else do you use the bye to prepare for the stretch run of the season. Six huge games coming up that now all of a sudden you look at and you're like, if Boise State handles their business, they do have a shot at, at running the table. I know November 5th against BYU here on the blue will be very tough, but if they take care of their bye week, they have a great shot to get hot down the stretch. So how do you best utilize the bye week if you're a player? Uh, I think it's first getting healthy if you're not healthy. That's huge. Um, I know practice wise, they're going to focus more on individual things. So what I mean by doing more individual is just technique type things, uh, helping guys get off the box better. Uh, I know our tackling has been good, but doing more tackling drills, working on things that we've struggled on offensively. Like I said, for receivers, I probably have my receivers working on creating more separation. That's something we've struggled on a bit. Uh, like just different things like that, honing on honing more in on those things rather than so much scheme because obviously we know what we're going to do scheme-wise. But just being able to kind of help your game that way, I think that's huge in the bye week. I mean, you get one week to do that, and then you just jump back into your normal routine. So I think that's that's something that they'll probably focus on a ton here, especially, I think, receiver-wise. Shane, you said get healthy during the bye week. This is more than just, you know, sitting around and – and waiting for a, basically a scab to heal over. How do you get healthy during the bye week if, if you're a player? Like, what does that process look like? Without knowing, I'm sure there's at least three players on this team that have high ankle sprains or some type of ankle sprain. Having an ankle sprain is, is tough because every day you have to go to practice on it and you continue to practice on it, so it never really gets a chance to heal. So this might be uh, guys who have been playing and had something like an ankle sprain, maybe they don't practice the first two or three days that gives you the monday that they already get off off the sunday where you do mostly recovery things off and then you give them tuesday and wednesday off so now that's four days where they used to just pounding and pounding and pounding on this ankle to kind of get it a little bit better and then when they do come back maybe they are doing a light work type things they aren't doing so much uh, it's just it's tough to recover from those injuries in season but I know that's going to be a big focus on is just trying to get guys, you know, to feel a bit better than what they have been because mm -hmm. they've had some tough games. And with all this running we've been doing, it's been a lot of contact. Yeah. I, I, yeah, you're, you're exactly right on that. Well, uh, Shane, as we wrap this thing up, um, we, we got to bring up really quick the fact that the, uh, the milk can is, is staying in Boise. Um, what, is it, what does that mean to see the boys out there that, you know, you, you once hoisted that trophy up, so what does it mean – to see the satisfaction on all their faces and getting to parade that milk can around the blue knowing they beat rival Fresno State. Man, it's awesome. It's always awesome to kind of have that item here at home because there's not a lot of teams or I think this might be the only team that we actually have that type of rivalry with. So it's huge because now we get, even for a year, to get to hold, push that thing up in our uh, facility. And I know that's going to be a big, big part next year of what they're going to talk about the hype up. Yeah. These guys want to go there and play. They'll talk about that. I know that thing sits right outside of Andy Avalos' office, so he gets a chance to see <laughs> that thing every day. Now, Shane, we appreciate you joining us. What, what are you going to do back in Texas? Like, what you, you hit Whataburger? Like, what, what are the must things you got to do in Texas uh, to, uh, to, yeah, to check all the boxes before you get back here next week? All right. Today's Wednesday. You know, I just got here. So today, you know, we got to find the food spots that I always have to hit. Thursday, I get to watch my Astros go take your Mariners to town. You know, we get to go watch that. <laughs> That's going to be a great one. Why did I even ask you that question? <laughs> then on Friday, I get to go watch my high school play. Uh, I haven't seen a Texas high school football game since I played in one. So it's been 10 years. 
since I've seen one. So I get to take my wife and my daughter. Uh, they've never been to a high school football game here, so they'll see how much different it is than, you know, in Idaho. So that'll be good. And then Saturday, I got a wedding I'm in, so that'll be fun. Sunday, I get to see all my family, and so it'll be a good good week. You know, it all starts, though, with those Astros, those Astros. You broke my heart yesterday, man. The Astros broke my heart yesterday. I thought the Mariners had it, had it in the bag. And uh, don't love the pitching. I don't, I don't love the decision we made out of the bullpen bringing Robbie Ray in. But let's face it, that's that's a, that's a discussion for some other podcast somewhere else. <laughs> Shane, I'm gonna go let you enjoy your family. Tell uh, tell Andrea and Sloan, I, I appreciate you let, uh, letting us steal a little bit of your time. Tell the rest of the family hi. Have an awesome time down in Texas. Can't wait till you're back here next week, and uh, we'll get after it again. Appreciate it. All right. For Shane Williams Rhodes, I'm Jay Tuss. This is Jay Sports Bar serving the Idaho sports community. We're going to do something a little fun as we send you away for the week. Here are the sights, sounds, and reactions of Boise State winning the milk can against Fresno State. Come on, baby. Yeah, it's a big deal. I got the milk. It's a big deal to our boosters. It's a big deal to our fan base. The guys, uh, they understand that. I'm very proud of them for uh, keeping the milk jug here. Man, it's great. And the rivalry we have between you know us and Fresno. Fresno's a great team, and we knew that. Uh, we knew it was going to be a dogfight coming in. Uh, yeah. Winning the milk can, man, it's, it's, it's great. It's a great feeling. It's a true blessing to be able to keep it on our side. Really proud of them. They, they deserve it. 